Welcome to the Baptist Reformation, where we do the work of recovering the Reformation in Baptist thought. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the Baptist Reformation. I hope you like the new look. Um, it's been a long time coming. been using just regular conventional webcams until now, so hopefully you guys like this better. It's a little easier on your eyes. I don't know if it makes me look any better. Uh, but that's beside the point. I want to produce quality content for my viewers and my listeners. Thank you for tuning in. Hey, uh, I, I want to get down to business. I uh, am teaching tomorrow at my church by God's grace and uh, because of the kindness of my pastor and his desire to invest in the young men who are pursuing, pursuing ministry in our church, I've been afforded the opportunity to teach the first part in a series on the doctrine of God for our Sundays, for our adult Sunday school hour. And uh, so, so uh, in line with that, I have started here on the Baptist Reformation a doctrine of God series. Surprise, surprise. Uh, yesterday, uh, I believe it was yesterday or day before, we, I, I gave the introduction. I uh, gave the introduction, which was the incomprehensibility of God. And I thought it was important to start there because uh, if we proceed in thinking that we can comprehend God, at least in an exhaustive sense, then there are going to be things that we just can't wrap our minds around, uh, and then we're just going to we're just going to throw them out, right? So uh, because everything has to be comprehensible to us. But we discussed how we can't comprehend God, but we can apprehend the truths that He has revealed to us in both nature and Scripture. We could call them the Book of Nature and the Book of Scripture, right? So, uh, there's things we can know about God. We can know God, at least as, insofar as he's revealed himself to us. All we can know about God is what God chooses to reveal to us. Um, so, this next, where we're going next, is actually the doctrine of divine simplicity. Or, stated in our catechism, in the Baptist catechism, it, it asks, What is God? Question 7. And it first says, God is a spirit. So, God is a spirit. Uh, and what does that mean? It means, A, God does not have a physical body. B, it means that God is not made up of any physical body parts. Uh, it, it means that he's not made up of his attributes. It means that he's not made up of a plethora of different properties. Uh, it also means that God is an active spirit, because that's what we read in Scripture. And God is the supreme spirit. Not just on a sliding scale of a greater being among many. But uh, he is actually supreme, distinct from his creatures that he has created. So, um, I, by the way, I, I want to introduce some helpful resources. Uh, in this study, I am using the Baptist Catechism. Uh, in the context of the Baptist Confession, the second London Baptist Confession, the 1689, uh, because the, the Baptist Catechism actually was drafted uh, soon after uh, within a matter of maybe 20 years, 15 years after the, the confession was actually published. So uh, the catechism came after the confession was completed. Uh, and so we need to kind of see the language in context, the language of the catechism in context, the language of the confession. Uh, and another helpful source is, of course, the Bible. <laughs> the Bible, Scripture, the truth of Scripture, the, su the uh, supremacy of God's Word, is assumed in all of this. So don't think of neglecting the words of Scripture. If you look in our confession, the 1689, it's laced with references to Scripture. Another resource would be Benjamin Badome's uh, commentary uh, on the catechism. I think my pastor called it a, a catechism on the catechism. Because <laughs> basically what he does is he uses the quaestio method of scholastic reasoning, and he he basically just produces a catechism on the catechism. So he, he, he asks the actual catechism question and the answer to the catechism question, and he, and, and he gives commentary on it by way of asking more questions about those questions. This is really useful. Uh, and he wrote in the 18th century, he wrote that volume, the commentary on the catechism. Uh, so those are some helpful resources. I think it's just a, a commentary on the Baptist Catechism by Benjamin Badome. You can get it on Solid Ground Christian Books. Um, so, yeah, uh, A, I mentioned uh, God is not a physical body. I think we all know that. We all would assume that as Christians. But it's important to realize that God is not, is not, uh, he's not like us in the sense that he's not confined to a fleshly vessel. He's not, 
he's not reliant on physical body parts to be who he is, and that's important. Uh, we know that, you know, in Scripture, it, it, it talks about God as if he does have, like, hands and, and arms and things of that nature. Uh, but that's just a use of, a, a particular use of language, we, we call it anthropomorphism, where the biblical authors are using something that we have experience with, i.e., like, our hands, and projecting that back onto God in order to communicate something that is true about God. That is, that God has power. God is fundamentally powerful. He's the very perfection of power itself. And so, biblical authors use, use language like that, anthropomorphisms, we would say, to analogically talk about or communicate truth about God uh, to, to, to readers, to the readers, right? So, God is spirit. He's not made up of a, of a body. He's incorporeal is what our confession would say, that he is not, uh, he is not, uh, he, he's, he doesn't have arms, he doesn't have legs, he's a spirit, right? He doesn't, he, he's non-spatially existent. That is to say, since I have a body, I am dependent on space to exist. Space must exist for me to have a body, uh, because a body extends through space materially, right? So, I have to have a, uh, you know, a context of space in order to have a body. Well, God is not dependent upon time, space, or matter for his existence, especially space. He's not dependent on uh, a room that he can be in, in which he also possesses a physical body. So, he, he does not depend on body parts to be who he is. He is spirit. He's non-spatially present or existent. Uh, scripture points to this. Uh, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, as John 4.24 says. Another place in scripture, And the Father who sent me, he has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his form. Uh, so, he's invisible, because he's a spirit, right? And invisibility is actually another attribute we'll, we'll, we'll get to. Invisibility, is it? Infinity is another Infinite is an attribute we'll get to, not invisibility. God is invisible because he's spirit. He's non-spatially uh, present. Going even beyond the corporeal aspect of it, right? Going even beyond the, you know, saying that God does not have a physical body, we would say that God's not made up or composed of body parts, yes. He's not composed of body parts. He's not composed of properties or attributes. We always talk about God's attributes, but I think it's really important to realize that God is not composed of those attributes that we so often enumerate, right? We'll say God has loved, or God is loving, God is just, God is merciful, God is, uh, God is light, God is, you know, all of these things that Scripture, Scripture itself ascribes these things to God. Um, you know, we go through, and in our language, we have to imperfectly list all of these out as if they are you know, separate things that accrue to the divine essence, but that's just not the case. God is perfection. God is a necessary being or the necessary being and therefore is not contingent upon attributes or properties to be who he is. Rather, when we talk about God's attributes, we are, we are talking about different aspects of God, uh, of the one true God who is not composed of anything more basic than himself to be who he is. So, God is not made up of things in order to be who he is. Attributes are just helpful linguistic placeholders, or <laughs> I don't want to say placeholders because they do, they communicate truth. Uh, analogical uh, words, words that are that are said analogically, uh, that, that deliver something to us, something that is true about God without actually one for one correlating to his essence. So, it's not, uh, we don't talk about God like we talk about our coffee mugs or uh, a bookshelf or, you know, this camera. We don't talk about God like that. Uh, we, we do, in a sense, we do talk about God like that because we have no other way but to predicate things about God like I would predicate things about this camera. But, the, but my words do not apply to God the same way that they directly apply to this camera or that bookshelf. That's analogical language. Um, you know, we could use anthropomorphism as, a, as an example. Just because a biblical author uh, says something, you know, like, like that God has an, a hand or ar his arm accomplishes things, obviously doesn't mean that uh, God has some physical cosmic arm that's in the universe doing things, right? I mean, that would be ridiculous. Nobody thinks that. But that does not mean that that biblical author is not communicating something that's fundamentally true about God. And that's how analogical language works. Um, 
when we say God has knowledge, we, we, we know that in God, because God's revealed this to us in his word, and obviously in nature, that in God there is something like knowledge, but it's obviously not knowledge like ours, because God's knowledge is a simple act. I mean, he knows everything immediately. We have to come to the facts, but God is omnipresent or omniscient. He doesn't have to come to the facts. He already knows everything immediately. He doesn't have to go through a process of reasoning to come to conclusions like we do. God is an active spirit. And I think when we talk about theology in the abstract, sometimes we forget about this. God is an active spirit. He's accomplishing his will within the, uh, the economy in which we present, presently live as humans, within the current created economy. He's accomplishing his will. Uh, and he does this by way of his spirit, ex, uh, ad, ad extra, sorry, ad extra, not ad intra. It's not as if the divine essence is changing as creation changes, like process theists might like to think. But, but he is accomplishing his will by way of his, by, by means, uh, through his providence, his providential involvement in creation. And so, uh, and, he, and, and this is an ad extra thing. His, his, will, his, his divine essence is not changing ad intra. It's an ad extra economy uh, of God. But he's accomplishing his will. I mean, we see this in John 5, 17, where, where uh, Jesus himself says, My father is working until now, and I myself am working. Uh, and then he, he also says, uh, but that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. Paul actually says that in Romans 1.19. So, uh, God is making things known uh, to, to his creatures by way of revelation. He's sustaining creation as we speak right now. If he didn't sustain creation, we would all be gone, essentially. And, uh, and, and Jesus himself says, the Father is working and he is working. And, and indeed, we know the Spirit is working. So, uh, you know, that's important to consider that God is involved with his creatures, those whom he created. The other thing is, is God is supreme. And this is the last point I'll hit because the battery is getting ready to die. And I don't want to lose you guys. Uh, God is supreme. And I don't mean that God is a supreme being among many beings. Uh, God is not the most powerful being among many other beings. Uh, it's not a sliding scale that we're talking about here. God is creator, and then creatures are creatures. There's two different, you know, th different things going on here. God is not a genie, a genus, uh, a creaturely genus. He's not involved. He's not to be seen in the context of a genus or a species. Uh, he, there's, there's, there's nothing. Uh, you know, uh, God is not uh, a type of being uh, distinct from. Uh, distinct from, you know, just simply more powerful than, than humans or whatever. God is different. Um, he's, he's completely, he's in one sense, he's separate from creation. He's distinct from creation. Yeah, he has revealed himself to us. I, I know that some people take issue with the, with the phrase holy other, that God is holy other. Uh, in a sense, yes, God is holy other in the sense that his divine essence does not uh, does not directly correspond to anything we have creaturely experience of. Uh, and uh, so that's why we have to talk about God analogically uh, in order to properly speak about him. And even then, our language falls short. Um, yet we can know true things about God. But God is, 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 when we, uh, R.C. Sproul put it this way, that the word being is one of the biggest misnomers within, uh, within philosophy and even theology. Uh, we, we, we say that we're human beings, right? We, we might say even that a cat is a kind of being. Uh, but really, being in the most proper sense of the term would only apply to God. God is, God is that which is self-existent. He is being, right? Uh, and so God just is. He is being. We're not like that. We can't say that. We're, we're contingent. We're dependent on God uh, for our existence. God is not dependent on anything, external to himself for his existence. He's not, he, he is self-existent. He's ase, we would say. He's self-existent. He exists by uh, virtue of his very nature. So he's necessarily existent. Creatures, no created thing exists this way. And this is why I say God cannot uh, just exist on the top end of a sliding scale of being. Because literally no creature exists in the way that God does. It's a completely different way of existing. 
uh, God exists necessarily, creatures exist contingently. We depend on many, many things for our very existence. Guys, I'm going to wrap it up. This is a very short one because, again, I, like I said, my battery's running out. I just kind of want to test it. I just kind of wanted to test the uh, new equipment here. Um, you know, we're going to continue on with this Doctrine of God series, and it'll be in this format. And obviously, the podcast will still be going. So, God bless you guys. Uh, have a good evening. And tomorrow, uh, as I'm recording this, tomorrow is Lord's Day. And if this is published later, which it will be, I hope you can't wait until next Lord's Day and that you will gather with the fellowship of the saints. Hebrews 10.25 tells us not to neglect the gathering of the saints as is the habit of some. So please be involved in your local church. God bless. Have a good one.